action plan, how we burn it. So we look and see how we're gonna burn it to get those objectives. So if we had a slope, if we started at the top and backed fire all the way down the hill, we, our dwell time is a little bit longer and it's more effective in killing some of the invasive plants. Whereas if we lit it at the bottom and just ran it up the hill, it wouldn't be as effective in killing the plants that we're trying to target. So then we have all these weather parameters. So in the prescribed burn plan, when we write the, the burn plan, we have weather parameters and those also affect our fire effects on the plants that we're trying to, trying to get rid of and trying to promote. Um, <clears throat> here in New Jersey, we have a, a window of October 15th to generally April 15th is our prescribed burn season here in New Jersey, um, but it's very weather dependent. So in general, we're looking at uh, below 70 degrees in temperature, above 25%, sometimes down to 20% relative humidity, um, at least two days after rain, sometimes three to four. Um, up here in the northern part of the state, because we have clay soils, we got to go three to four, maybe five days, because the soil will still be giving off moisture into those fuels if it's laying on the ground. So sometimes we have to wait a little bit longer. And that's all written into the burn plan. Um, so there, once we get these burn plans, they all get signed. Um, and then the land map, land steward or the land managers get a copy of the burn plan and basically it's a it's a uh, written contract between us and them uh, the fee schedule is billed after we do the burn so nobody has to pay anything up front nobody pays anything and it's based on the uh, flat fee of 250 dollars up to 25 acres and then after that additional cost per acre um, so it's very cost effective if you're to look at spraying for some plants. You know, you can treat a lot more for that $250 for 25 acres than if you were to go in there and spray and have to over spray and kill some of the other plants. So it's a very cost effective method for controlling some of the invasives that we have. So, so the timing is a huge thing in why we burn and how we manage um, the vegetation. So we can also, they're finding more and more that it can also be effective in killing ticks. Um, so it's also another pest that we can get rid of there too. Uh, so if you look at this screen, uh, very much talks about why we burn. Historically, fire used by Native Americans to clear forested understories of saplings and shrubs promote an open like park like Savannah. Um, Penn State did some research about three years ago now uh, on what people would like to see and they had different pictures up uh, and you were able to vote on which picture you would like to see and typically people would like to see it that Savannah type canopy overstory with open underbrush so that you can see the wildlife and it's not just this big thick green wall. So that's uh, some of the things that fire can do, okay? So if we go over to that specific effects on the left-hand side of the page, control thin bark non-fire adapted woody vegetation. So we're talking some of those pioneer species of trees in a, in a field like, this, like the cedar tree, uh, the red cedar, uh, birch trees, some of the young saplings in the case of uh, locust trees, okay, you can control them with fire. Um, light levels at light levels at ground level. So by taking some of these uh, other trees out that are non non species specific, we can create light in and promote growth of acorn producing trees and also some of the other ones, the hickories and nut producing trees, which is great for the, uh, great for the wildlife, okay? Um, down there it says reduces the leaf litter to allow increased seed production uh, or sprouting. So that's another, another thing that we get out of this as well, okay? So there's a, 
these are the typical different ignition techniques that we use. Um, what you're seeing here is a flanking fire picture. Um, the gentleman is using a drip torch and he's got a back burn coming in from behind him on his right on the right hand side of the screen and he's bringing fire up along the side and for each one of those firing techniques you get a different fire effect on the landscape um, and you don't want it all the same so by doing a backing and flanking fire you change the fire effects and you change the speed that the fire affects all the plants on the ground. So strip fire is another one. Uh, head fire is just in line with the wind and slope. Um, and then a spot fire is just dotting and letting it go wherever it goes, wherever it naturally meanders and gets that mosaic pattern on the ground, you get that different fire effects. It could be a little depression. It could be a little bit of a slope. So it'll change and increase the speed of the fire and increase the fire effects on the, on the plants that are there. So this is a series of pictures from Alamuchi State Park. Uh, this is a prescribed burn. This is a dirt road going into Alamuchi. It's warm season grasses, uh, estimated to be three and a half to four feet tall. Um, you can see on the, on the picture, you're getting flame lengths of at least three to four feet, okay? To do this field takes about 10 to 15 minutes. So the next picture is after we've completed it, rung it, and it's all burning together. Um, you're getting again 15 to 18 foot flame lengths off of this. Totally consumes the grasses. If you look down along the road in the center of the picture, you can see where the grasses were. And then immediately thereafter, you still have a little bit of smoke, but there's very little fire left at all. Okay, if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, right on the edge, you'll see a little bit of fire in the smoke and within 10 minutes, the whole thing is done. So this one is from Mercer Meadows. Um, this is the third year that we have burned down there at Mercer Meadows. This year was a big undertaking of 440 acres of grasslands. I was down there a week post burn, uh, I took the dog and my wife and we were walking around and talking with folks and I didn't have any idea ID on that I was a, the guy that did it. So just asking folks, so what do you think about prescribed burning? And several people were like, we've never seen as many birds as we have this time. You know, usually we don't get to see them all. So I, the perception from the public that was there that day, uh, several of them had cameras couple of them had binoculars and they were specifically looking for birds. Um, the perception of the public was that it was good, okay? Um, at least in the interaction that I had with them. And of course, I didn't tell them that I was the person that did it. We just left it alone at that, uh, just to see how they, what they thought about prescribed burning. Uh, it's just a management tool. It reduces the thatch immensely on the ground um, and it helps cut costs on mowing because they'd have to bring somebody in under a contract to do the mowing. Um, and then when we did cider mill, we were talking about this before, I find it very interesting that all the little cedar trees when they mow, they keep continue to grow unless they're cut off completely on the ground. So they look like little bonsai trees. They're about six inches tall and eight inches around. Uh, after we burnt it, they were all brown. They went in and mowed the field again after we had burned it. Some parts didn't burn that well. And the same brown shrubs were sitting there on the ground. But now they're dead and they're still there, but they're not gonna come back. So again, it's just a, another cost-effective tool that we can use. Um, even if we don't kill it all, and Michael speak on this a little bit uh, with the burning that we've done up at Audubon, we don't kill the plant completely, but we, at least top kill it so it's easier for them to go back in. And now they're only spraying something that's maybe four inches around versus a, a barberry that could be five and a half feet tall and five feet around. And then you have to worry about overspray and killing, you know, your spice bush or any of the other plants that could be in the woods around it. So now you're just concentrating on that little six inch stump sprout coming out of the base of that plant. 
So this is another one from Mercer Meadows. Uh, the equipment that we use are UTVs with small tanks or also uh, our trucks. Um, the good thing about Mercer Meadows is we, we pretty much are burning off of one of the trails, either paved or dirt uh, or the paved road. So again, you can see the flanking fire on both. This is a backing fire in front of us going down the, parallel to the road and then flanking fire across the back of the, the picture. Again, every one of those changes the effect on the stuff that it's burning. So this one happens to be up at um, <clears throat> Somerset County Environmental Education Center located next to the Great Swamp. Uh, the some of the fellows that are in the picture actually work at Great Swamp. We do a lot of work together uh, in Somerset County and Mercer County. Um, so they put up these signs in the meadows and they talk about mowing, they talk about prescribed burning and stuff like that. So these are all some of the stewardship things that they're doing. Uh, Somerset County is expanding their prescribed burning program besides up there at the Environmental Ed Center, we also do Washington Valley Park. Um, and now they're gonna do Natarar and over at uh, Duke Island Park as well. So, so these two pictures here from Six Mile Run uh, can, if you can get the fire to go into the cedar trees and get it into the crown, and typically the fall is a better time to do that, um, you can kill cedar trees that are six to eight foot tall, 12 foot tall. Um, but generally, this was taken when we were only allowed to burn in the spring, so we weren't getting the fire effects that were there. Um, so they really need to go in there with a machine and masticate it all and then go back to starting from scratch and prescribed burn there. This is again, Six Mile Run State Park. So these are from up at Washington Valley. So we do do just besides the grasslands, we also do wood blocks and forest blocks. Uh, we take the UTV and drive it. We use natural trails in some locations. Some locations we end up using either a plow or a disc. Uh, in the forest to create that fire line that we burn off of. And then we have to go back in and rehab it. So just a little idea of we do woods as well. So these are some of the ones that we've done at night. Again, um, kind of interesting to do it at night. You get a lot of phone calls from 911. What is your emergency? There's a huge fire, uh, but it's, Sometimes we fall out of prescription, meaning our RH gets too low or our temperature gets too high, and then we have to stop burning because that's a danger of it escaping. So we stop burning, wait until the RH comes back up to an allowable error or the temperature comes back down, and then we can go back to burning again. Several times I've had to do this over the years. Uh, this is from up at the New Jersey Audubon. So this is actually their office right there on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, one of the first years we burnt there, we burnt right from the foundation of the building, um, lit it, let it burn up to the foundation, put it out and let it burn away. So uh, again, another one you can see, this is a strip firing technique where we're just walking down through the woods and putting strips through the woods and through the brush fields. Um, and it changes that fire effect. It increases and decreases as you're going through. So it changes that fire effect on the landscape. Uh, several of the oaks that are in here are big enough that they will survive this little bit of fire that goes through there based on the speed that it goes through. And it does promote more oak regeneration underneath. So Another one, you can see the fire line that we've constructed using leaf blowers. Uh, so we're talking something that's only like three foot wide um, and we're just letting it burn away from the line and continue on through the woods. So this is the folks from uh, Mercer Meadows. This is the first year we burnt there. Um, we're looking at fire effects and seeing the base of some of these saplings that they wanted to get rid of in this field and figuring out did we kill it or did we not? And we're looking for splits in the, in the cambium of the bottom of the plant uh, from the re resident time and dwell time of the fire. 
And yes, this plant was pretty much dead. So this is taken about 15 minutes after the burn had gone through. Um, if you look, the smoke column in the back, you can actually see the fire in the back. So we've already completed this little area and now we're looking at the fire effects and seeing first order fire effects. Did we kill it? Yes, all the grass is gone. Um, the bark is split on all these seedlings. So chances are it's gonna die. Um, and then within five minutes of the fire being like this, you start having all the birds come back in and landing into the trees and the shrubs that are still there and then feeding on the insects and anything else. Um, turkey vultures will come back in and the, the harriers or the kestrels are out there feeding on any mice that didn't get out of the way or moles. Um, so they're in there feeding right away afterwards. That's all I have for you. Um, I'm believing Mike is gonna present next and we'll take questions and answers afterwards. I think that's working, is it? Yes, except we need you to start your video. Okay. How do I do that? Uh, uh, lower left-hand screen. Can send you a prompt. Oh, that'll work. Oh, okay, there you go. Start video, got it. And you share your screen. And share my screen again. Phone screen. Oh, there it goes. Is that working now? No. I'm gonna give it a second. No, I'm not seeing it yet. Yeah, down at the bottom. So just hover over the bottom. There's the share screen right in the middle of that bar along the bottom of the Zoom screen. You have to put your cursor down there. Uh, I gotta go back a little bit here. I don't see the um, button. It's, uh, do you know where to find the chat? And no, my whole screen is filled up now. Let me see if, um, oh, show taskbar. That works, I think. Nope. Well, we've got you back again. You disappeared <laughs> for a while there. Did I? Yeah. Um, it's down at the bottom of the Zoom screen when you, where you will see share screen. You have yeah, to... the same location where you're finding the start video button right, down right, there. Right, right. It, it's along to the right of that. I believe it's actually colored green as well. It is, yeah. And it has a little arrow above it. It's not popping up. Uh, let me see. I should start the slideshow again. Yeah, if, if that isn't started, you should do that, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm not seeing the green button. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you in, can you see the Zoom There we go. Now I got it. You got it. I think. Is that working? No, you got to click on it. It's working before. Hmm. Yeah, it did work before. Um, so are you seeing the Zoom window with the four squares uh, with our names in your video? Uh, no. Hmm. Let me what try you... something else here. Nothing. Uh, what if you go down to your task bar? Can you see your yeah. task bar? Can you see the Zoom, um, the running Zoom icon yeah, that, in your task bar? Yeah. And click on that to then hopefully that should bring up the Zoom window. Right. Is that up? Uh, do you see it? Do you now see the four squares with our names in your video? No. No. Um... 
maybe click on the zoom at the well where yeah wherever your taskbar is might be in a different place mine's at the bottom Oh, I think I see the four square now. Good. Okay, if you see that, then you should be able to find the share screen button down the bottom. Yeah, you might need to hover over it. So go down below the pictures. Yeah. And it should come up. And you'll see a whole bunch of stuff like mute, start video, participants, chat, share screen, record, raise hand, that sort of thing. So the share screen is right there near the center of the screen, but more towards the left. I'm not seeing that open up at all. Mm. Mm. Um. Oh. How about that? Did that do anything? No? Still not. No. Unfortunately, I cannot prompt you to share your screen. I thought I did that. So you've got your slideshow started and everything. Can you see, you should be able to see it on your own screen and then you just share it with us. Yeah, I see it on my own screen. It's, yeah. it's starting. I just can't find the green box to share it with you. Yeah, you have to get back to the Zoom yeah, app you can get back to the Zoom now. Um, to find the share screen button. That's that's where it's going to be in that Zoom app with the four squares and the chat and the panelist list. Um, Oh, there we go. I think I got it. Did that work? No. Not yet. We're still just seeing ourselves names. Yeah, I see your names. Yeah. Okay. And so it should be right there at the bottom. Yeah, the share screen should be down at the bottom with all the other controls. Do you see any of the other controls at the bottom? If you Yeah, I see the chat and the raise hand and record and apps. Yeah, the chat the share screen should be right to the right of the chat yeah and then you just you know click on that i clicked on it it's just not uh oh hmm that's so is is he somehow barred from sharing a screen jim no everybody can share everybody can share and, yep, all panelists can share at all times. Oh, there, oh, yes, there yes. we are. Yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I did. Now we're sharing all of your slides all at once. So I guess. Okay, you so how do I get away from that? Well, um, so you need to go to, I think, start slideshow. How's that? That looks better. That's I remember, cool. yeah, go to display settings now. Uh, at the top at the top of your screen yeah and click that down and swap presenter view yeah there we go perfect uh, sorry about that hey. no problem we got there in the end so count so we should just start out if anybody hasn't been here before you know a little bit about uh sherman hoffman and new jersey audubon we're in the eastern edge of the highlands bisected by the Passaic River that flows into the Great Swamp. And all we wanted to do really was to say this is a little different than the meadows. The uh, highest elevation is about 600 feet, lowest is 300. It's it's category one stream. We're adjacent to Morristown National Historic Park. We got about a 6,000 acre 
linear um, property line that we share with the national park. There are several other national or state and county parks uh, adjacent as well. And they all have the same problem that we have uh, with Japanese barberry. So I guess I can't really ask if anyone doesn't know what Japanese barberry is, but can you see my cursor in there? No. Um, yes, we, we can see your cursor. Okay, so that way I can point. This is where the center is, the Pacific River runs through it. Uh, we also have property over on this side of Chestnut Avenue. Um, this is George's map that he talked about before. We map all the areas out. This is from a couple of years ago, actually. The reason I wanted to show this one is it's an infrared satellite photo that shows anything that's green as red. So all the grassy backyards, the nice green lawns in development across the street here are actually green. And what we're seeing in this satellite image is that the red we're seeing in this corner by the National Park on that 5,000 foot property line is, is all Japanese barberry. They only take the satellite infrared photos about every five years. Um, so this one is now outdated. The area inside the green lines here was the 14 acre burn from a couple of years ago. That's all barberry is gone, um, as is this area down here and our same with all the fields. The, the plan this year was to burn about 20 acres up here to this area and another 10 or 15 acres here and another 12, I think, along Indian Grave Brook, a tributary to the main stem of the Passaic. So that's, that's where we are. Um, this is the top of the hill. It gets a little squirrely trying to climb up and down the hill and be burning at the same time. Uh, the dense stands of Japanese barberry, um, I'll just skip to a picture. Well, I should mention the, um, our goals were to reduce deer population and eradicate the barberry. Barberry is a symptom of too many deer. The deer don't eat it. It's the only thing that grows in the understory. I think there should be a uh, slide here in a second of that. So we, we've erected a 15 acre deer fence that goes back to 04, I think. Prior to that, we fenced and did an inventory of an area that was an acre and a half. In that area, we counted and inventoried all the trees, there were 226 based on the diameter and height. And that's why we wanted to look through the fence here. You can see that there's tall trees and there are no small saplings. There's no spice bush, there's no witch hazel, there's no, Maple leaf by Burnham, uh, those all die off after about 15, 20 years and have to be replaced by new shoots. The new shoots are browsed on by the deer. So we get this monoculture of Japanese barberry. Uh, it's nasty stuff. And it, unfortunately, at this concentration, it changes the pH of the soil, which inhibits the germination of any native plants. So even if we get rid of all the barberry, it's going to take five years before the um, pH might go back to normal. Uh, on the other side of the fence, this was about 15 years in after the fencing project. You can see the barberry as far as the eye can see up the hill. There's nothing but big trees. So this is sort of the perfect storm scenario. We're not hurting any small trees. We're not killing any small trees or herbaceous plants because there are none. They've all been eaten. Um, if we look the other side of the fence, this is 15 years young. There's probably in view here about 35 small woody saplings that are 15 years young, maybe 10. Um, so we're getting good growth once we've eliminated the deer, but we also have to get rid of the Japanese barberry. And that's where George comes in. He's magic. I don't know anything about burning or forest fire stuff. Everything I know I've learned from him. We have about seven acres of fields that we burn about every third or fourth year. In the perfect world, we would only burn half of them in any given year so that we have things going on in the other fields that um, aren't going to be affected. So the 
By doing this in April, it's before the reptiles and amphibians are really active. We did our grassland burn this year in February. I think that's the earliest we've ever done it so that we could avoid the vernal pond obligates. We have about, well, there's the vernal ponds down here. Uh, you can't quite see them in this field, but there's about four in this field. We didn't burn right around those. They're in this little nook down here. There's 14 vernal ponds on the property. This is at uh, Barberry. You can almost see greening up up here um, and, and across over into here. That was our target. And that is an, our ongoing target. Um, you can see the red again in these images. This is a plan from another year. I've forgotten which one it was. We revise them every year. This is no longer red. That has all been burned out. So. That was a 2016 or 17 burn. These are the areas we're targeting now. And we're really hoping for a once and done. We're gonna burn these. As George said, it top kills the barberry. And then some poor slob, and that would be me, has to walk through the Japanese barberry and get shredded by it in the summer. And anything that didn't burn hot enough, we treat with an herbicide. And that kills it all. Um, it takes several years post burn to eliminate those, those uh, recurring plants. And we do conduct sweeps um, every year so that any new young plants that come up, we just, you can grab them, they're very small and pull them out by the roots and we won't have to do that again. So we've got about 150 acres total of Japanese barberry on the property. The property is 300 acres. It's interesting, and you can see it on this image here, I think, actually the one before, let me go back to this one. Uh, you can't see it here. Um, maybe on one of the next ones. Some of these hillsides, see up in here, there's no Japanese barberry. It only grows on the south and east facing slopes. It doesn't grow on the north facing slopes and it doesn't grow under real shady plants like American beech. So there's patches on the north side that there's no barberry, we don't have to treat it. So we had about 150 acres total that we're working on. We've gotten about 75 acres completed at this time and we'll continue working on these remaining tracks. This one is actually grown to, we remapped it, it's 20 acres along the National Park property. There's uh, 12 acres here, nine there and 12 up on Chestnut Avenue. So that's what we have left. And then there's another little piece over in here someplace that all of a sudden popped up. So we added that this year. So roughly it was 60 acres we were looking for. You can see the steep slopes. Most of the time we use hiking trails, roads, driveways, that sort of thing. Actually, I'm not sure. Will this play a video? Yeah, there you go. So you can see the guy using the drip torch. I think that's George himself right there in a white hat. The leaves carry the flames and they're going to, as George says, top kill the Japanese barberry. It's going right past a lot of the trees in the picture here and not really affecting them at all. In fact, some of the leaves get left behind. So it, it's not a scorched earth burn. It's really just literally burning off the top leaf litter layer. Um, it's not getting into the clay soils. It's top killing the Japanese barberry. I think that's not what I wanted to do. We'll try and go forward. And I didn't know that George was going to use this slide or I wouldn't have used it, but that's where he has burned some of our uh, grasslands immediately adjacent. We can't really mow that slope without using a um, self-propelled 30 inch brush hog, which is I don't know which it hurts more every time we use it. It hurts me or the mower. The mower breaks every year we use it and it kind of is out of commission. But this one was just burned and it's looking real good. There's lots of native plants. There's lots of pollinators. And we don't, as I said, burn everything every year. So we're not completely wiping out any of the insect populations. This is rising as they call it, uh, or George does the black. So after the area has been burned off, this would have been an April 14th or April 10th burn. These ferns are Christmas ferns. They're emerging from underneath. You can see the leaf litter is not even completely burned off. There's the old Christmas 
Fern fronds. These are the new fiddleheads coming up. So we get pretty good lush growth and it apparently, or so I've been told, releases a lot of nutrients and makes the plants grow better. There's some dwarf ginseng came up, um, some trout lilies. Uh, the blood roots are one of my favorites. When we did the original deer exposure in 1999, we found one blood root plant under a multiflora rose that was um, umbrella-like. It was about 10 foot tall and 15 foot across. And there was one solitary plant in there. It's a fascinating plant because there's a seed pod that you might be able to see right here. Uh, and ants collect the seed pod. They're not interested in the seeds, but something called lignum that's in the seed pod itself. And they drag that seed pod to their nest or den or someplace. Um, and that's how the seeds are dispersed. And that's the early, it's a spring ephemeral flower. So this has just come out a week to 10 days after that April 10 burn. And you wind up with this lush growth of uh, blood root, which we don't find outside the deer fence at all until the last couple of years. We've, we've been making a little bit of headway on the deer population. Um, we were helped this past year by a disease that pretty much wiped out 80% of the herd. So the May apple and the blood root is just popping up all over the place. Some of the other favorites of mine that are found only inside the deer fence. These haven't shown up outside, probably because of the pH of the soil. Our best burn was in 2017 and it's about five years. So we started to see some of these showing up around the perimeter of the fence the last year or two. Inside the deer fence is acting as a refugia for these native plant seeds. They come in on their own. They're doing very well. They're spreading like crazy. I just took a walk up there this afternoon. Uh, the maple leaf viburnum is the lifeblood in the understory of the forest, and it is thriving inside the fence. Still haven't seen any of that outside the fence yet. It may take a couple more years. We have to wait for the seed dispersal to occur from that site inside the deer fence. These were my daughter's favorites. So we call them Emily and Jesse Rose. That's called doll's eyes. And those turn uh, bright porcelain white at the tips of these uh, plants. They were not on the property at all for probably the last 25 or 30 years. And they showed up on their own after we put the deer fence up in 99. George talked a little bit before about fire breaks. So, we just couldn't resist using a no parking fire lane. We got to change that to fire break. We use driveways, we use drainage ditches, we use trails, we use roads, um, just a hiking trail. You can see the barberry on one side. This was right after the burn and the top killed barberry on the right side. This is now been five or six years and it's starting to fill in with some of the native plants. We've got some spice bush in there. We've got bits and pieces of blood root showing up. I think they'll probably still get browsed by the year, uh, by the deer. I, I go out there and, and check too often. My boss says, he says, I should be in the office. And I told him, well, you have to expect what you inspect. So um, that was George's video again of the um, burning that steep hillside off. That was a killer hill. Um, I'm glad we don't have to do that again. This is one of the next burns. This is on top of the hill. It's mostly level. We've got this all circled. There's about four or five parcels so that George could probably burn the top of the hill off in the smaller parcels and then do a head fire down at the bottom of the hill by Eric's house. And we can all watch it race up the hill and then run out of fuel at the top because we'd already burned it off, be like this. Um, I was surprised and learned something new the last time they burned and when they're trying to direct the fire, if there's no wind, they use a leaf blower. So there's, there's another lesson we learned. The hardest lessons for me on those real effective, uh, productive prescribed burns are that some of the dead snags are gonna burn for four or five days and every car driving down hard scrabble road at night is gonna dial 911 and they call the fire department and the fire Chief is still mad at me from that 2017 burn because they got calls all night long. Um, George finally came out with his trusty chainsaw and cut down the tree. Uh, this is a different snag, but 
the snags are our biggest challenges because it took us probably three or four days around the clock to get all the hot spots out. I was um, almost pleased that we didn't have as big a burn this year because it was a lot easier putting out the hot spots. What, what is probably the most amazing to me is how these guys can burn the fields we want, not burn the trail where we cut the grass, and not completely burn out the cedar trees that I forgot to mow a circle around. Um, methods, pros and cons. We've removed the barberry with a weed wrench. I loaned mine out, so I don't have a picture to show you. It's a six foot hand, long handled uh, tool that's like a vice grip on the bottom. You cinch the vice grip around the base of the barberry and get two guys to lean on that long six foot handle and rip it out of the ground. It's very labor intensive. It took us 400 hours to do that first acre. And if we did a whole um, another 75 acres, that'd be about 30,000 hours. So it's not really practical. We still use a weed wrench on occasions on small patches or places where there's not enough to justify a burn or we can't burn for other reasons. Uh, we've dug the barberry out with a backhoe. It's very expensive. It's very tough on the equipment. Uh, it's tougher on the landscape. It rips the whole place up and it's very time consuming. The other trick we tried was that 30 inch brush hog that breaks every time we take it out. It works if the ground isn't rocky. It's tougher on the operator, I think, than on the machine and the machine breaks every year. The benefit to using this, it's the same top kill method as burning in the forest. Um, we still have to go back and treat whatever re-sprouts with an herbicide. So this uses, it's better than nothing and we'll use it in some areas where we can't burn or can't get a, a bigger brush hog in. Um, we, I've seen people use forestry mowers. It's a track machine. It's like a bobcat or something that has a, a flail mower or a brush hog on the front. They work. It uses less herbicide. You still have to go back through and post treat everything that re-sprouts. It's cost prohibitive. You know, it's going to cost a uh, thousand dollars an acre, and I don't have seventy-five thousand dollars to throw at it. Um, it is good in that you don't have to use herbicide as much. Um, but it's very hard not to mow some of the plants that are mixed in with the Japanese barberry that weren't killed off or top killed by the, um, by the prescribed burning. Um, we've done a lot of cutting with loppers. I have 25 to 30 pair of loppers and we have volunteer teams come out. We'll cut a lot of areas on roadsides uh, along the stream banks on islands in the stream was the most recent one we worked on, very labor intensive. It's the same as using the prescribed burn because we use very little herbicide. We treat it post-treat the cutting. We've top killed it by, by cutting it down. Some places I know they just spray with herbicide and they spray everything and, and we don't like to use herbicide. Uh, this uses the most herbicide, so we're not going to use that method at all. We never have. Um, this is our chosen method, um, the prescribed burning. It's very fast, it's cost effective, uh, uses the least amount of herbicide, has the least amount of overspray. Downside of it is it's intensive work to prepare the fire breaks. I probably spent way too much time out of the office, at least that's what my boss said, working on fire breaks. Uh, we have to close trails for the day. I don't mind that for one day. Um, I, my wife is mad about spending several nights here mopping up. She thinks that I, I'm doing something else and, and George can be my witness. He was here helping me put out the hot spots every time the police called uh, and the fire department called and, and we had all that. The other downside, as I said, is that um, it does burn the overwintering butterfly and, and moth chrysalis. Um, it's also gonna affect a lot of other insects that we're, we're not as aware of. Um, certainly not going to affect anything that's on the tree trunk, probably not the, um, the moss that we're all concerned about because the flames are relatively low in that closed canopy of the forest, which is our priority burn areas. Um, we wanted to finish with a couple of the woodland flowers. This one's actually a field flower. Uh, the, the deer always got, we moved it inside the fence. This is uh, the wood lily. Um, we already talked about the downsides. 
Our best burns occur in early April after the barberries leafed out, but before the spring ephemerals have emerged, before the birds are nesting, before the amphibians and reptiles are out and about. Another downside would be the smoke. We, we don't like creating the smoke and the air pollution, but it's a necessary evil. Um, and of course, my wife's complaint about the three nights putting out hotspots. So that's our chosen method. Um, we continue to mow, cut by hand on easy, and not areas that are not easily burned. And there's my one bird picture at the end of the program, which is my backyard screech owl. Put that up and it was seven years before we got a screech owl in the box. And um, now it's roosting on the front porch of the house. Go figure. Uh, it's hiding on top of the cross country skis that I have in the rafters. And that's about it. I think we could open for questions if anybody is still listening. <laughs> Thank you, George and Mike. That was very educational. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or use the Q&A tool that you can find down the bottom of the screen. I did answer some of the questions that were up before while Mike was presenting. So, okay, let's see what we've got in here. Okay, so in the question and answer, Fairfax Hutter has quite, has a number of questions. Um, would, would you like to open those up or shall I just read them? Or Jim, do you want to read them? Uh, I can read them if you like. Okay. Maybe that will be easier so George can concentrate or whoever can concentrate on the answers. Sure. She's asking about the uh, benefits and hazards of Piedmont woodland burns. Um, do the burns affect the soil microbial and fungal communities that the trees and other plants rely on? Or are the burns too low intensity to affect the soils, affect under the soil surface? You're not gonna, you're not gonna affect that the microbial or the fungal communities, okay? Because it is a low intensity burn. Just by backing or flanking fire, you're gonna change the depth of the leaf litter, um, but you're not gonna affect that so much. Um, and then he has, in the absence of deer, do you expect the burns to give native species such as spice bush? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the species that we see in our woods today are not native species um, and they're not fire adapted species. So like that spice bush and some of those, the viburnums, if we do kill some of them, we're also exposing the seed bed to come back and bring more of them back by taking out the invasives because typically our invasive species like the barberry um, up there in that Piedmont area, they leaf out before anything else. And like Mike said, they don't, they're not consumed by deer, they're not eaten by anything. And as far as the, the, I don't know if you've ever walked through them, Mike and I can attest, I pull splinters out for almost a month and a half out of my thighs and my shins after walking through there burning. Um, they're like little needles that go right into you. So nothing wants to chew on it. So, you know, if we kill some of the, native species that are there, we're exposing now the seedbed. And like Mike alluded to with the pH question, you know, it might take five years, but now we don't have that invasive there taking up that space. And we're able to give those other native plants a head start. So um, the growing season burns, Pennsylvania does a lot of growing season burns on their uh, fish and game properties in Pennsylvania. Um, they also do timber harvests on their fish and game properties. So basically they'll go in and do a timber harvest. They'll go in and masticate all the remaining tops in the winter. And then they do a growing season burn in July and August and burn all that stuff up in that growing season. Uh, the problem that we have here if we try to do that is typically our window gets very small because of the heat and humidity and the ozone alert days, like Mike said about the smoke, we get an ozone alert day, we can't burn. Um, 
air pollution people just freak out over us burning when there's an ozone alert day. They <laughs> they lose their mind. So we we can't do that in August. Um, we might be able to get away with it in June and July. Currently, I have two burns that are slated that I could do for growing season burns. And also we're gonna do a little test burn at Washington Valley Park um, into July, trying to control Japanese stiltgrass, just a target species burn of about uh, an acre of Japanese stiltgrass. We're gonna to try to burn it and we know the seed bed is there underneath it. So we're gonna to try to continue to burn it in July pick a two week window and try to do it year after year to control that Japanese stiltgrass and just see how effective that is on that target species, you know? So um, as far as long-term studies, there's several going on. Um, one of them is being done by Raritan Valley College by Jay Kell. Um, he's also doing it in conjunction with the deer population study that he's doing. Um, and I've done some prescribed burning for him on a couple different NRH properties. Um, he's also jumped into Somerset County Parks and Middlesex, or not Middlesex, Morris County Parks to do sampling there as well on the invasives that we're killing and the new stuff that's coming up. So his stuff is out there, um, you know, it's still research ongoing. You know, he started it two years ago now, maybe three, and he's continuing to work on it. He presented last year at the Invasive Species Conference um, over at Duke's Farm. I gave his first presentation on it. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Next question. Yeah, uh, Hannah Southers asked if you can burn Climax Forest with almost solid barberry understory. Not really. Um, unless there's a lot of leaf litter on the ground, okay? Um, when it's so thick, and this is a problem that Jay had with some of his test plots that he had put out in uh, Milford Bluffs, it was so thick that you couldn't get fire to run through it, okay? You just there was no leaf litter between that and the autumn olive. There was no leaf litter there to get to go through. Uh, with the autumn olive, you only get small little leaves that are about the size of between a quarter and a half dollar, and they're flat, and they just don't they don't get dry enough. Okay, um, <laughs> it's just one of those things. There are places that you might have to masticate before you burn, you know, and depending on who's running the masticating machine, you can, you can do a good job and kind of get a couple of strips through there, maybe run some fire through there on the strips and see if you can get it to creep either direction. So that would be like a strip firing technique. So. I think uh, ask Canna is, is, if the Climax Forest is solid, Barberry understory. Is there anything else there besides a barberry? Our experience here is that you know we have a monoculture of Japanese barberry. There's nothing else there but barberry and big tree trunks. And if that were the case, and I would think we would be able to burn the barberry. Your the barberry up there is is not as dense as some other places I've seen it. I mean, the one place that sticks in my mind is just off the off of the state property over at Milford Bluffs. And we're talking a wall of barberry that's thicker than that park that's over towards the school, Mike, that hillside one. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it is it is just a green carpet of barberry, five foot tall, where you're getting thorns from your shoulders to your ankles, you know? Um, and there was hardly any leaf litter underneath it. Um, and it was all green when we were there still trying to burn it and it was early. So, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Like I said, it's just a tool in the toolbox. Sometimes it's not the, uh, not the answer. Okay, Hannah also asked um, about wood frogs and spotted salamanders. Uh, they were in the vernal pools in the February and early March this year uh, with burning it after they were there, uh, kill them once 
you know they depart the the pools that's a good question you know the vernal pond obligates are only going to move to the ponds on those warm rainy nights and certainly we won't be burning them um they're not in the pools probably more than two weeks we may see amphibians in the pools egg laying and mating whatever uh for for several weeks but for the most part they leave and are gone and they're probably at least here back into the leaf litter if it's cold um and and possibly not affected this year we burned around one vernal pond and actually the flames went across on ice and burned up the cattail so that's one of the reasons we wanted to try the February burn. Uh, it's usually before the amphibians are going to the ponds um, and it's before there's open water. So I think that it's probably not affecting them that much. To add to that, we've added, I think 14 or 15 vernal ponds to the property. Uh, the first year we counted six in the first pond. The second year we counted well, we stopped counting at 100. Um, so we've already increased the population quite a bit. And by adding the other 13 or 14 ponds, I, I suspect that the population of amphibians is probably through the roof. I wouldn't burn any area, hopefully more than once, if we can get a good burn in there. So our once and done method we might affect some of the uh, vernal pond obligates, but certainly not all of them. And it's a population that will rebound with suitable um, ponds and, and habitat. So I, I'll chime in on that too, because when I do proposals for state property, um, it goes through the LMR process in the state, um, regardless of where it is, it goes to TD, the threatened endangered species folks, and it goes through their review. Everybody that has anything to do with state parks and anything has the right to say, no, you can't burn, or you can burn, but it has to be done before this date. Okay. And they're hard and fast on that generally. Um, so I know some of my brother firefighters down south have problems with stuff coming back that they can't burn or they have to negotiate with. Um, sometimes they have to put the plow line in when it's frozen um, and they can only do this plow line this time of year specific because of corn snakes or rattlesnakes, okay, things like that. So they look at every species or something that might have been seen there. And in the case of burning down at Cider Mill, that was one of the concerns was the short-eared owl. And I've spent two nights down there looking to see if I could see a short-eared owl and then walking out where I saw him get up and making sure there wasn't any nest there, you know, and that's, that's a personal thing for me. Um, my name goes on that burn, burn plant, you know, so I want to make sure that this species is not being affected. Um, the day we burned it, I had two of them get up within 20 feet of me and take off to another field. Um, and the kestrels, same thing, they were there and then they left and they were back the next day hunting for all the mice and other things. So, you know, does it affect every one of them? Probably not because we can time it, like Mike said, at his place or in the case of when we burned cider mill, the, the frozen stuff had already gone. I wanted to do some prep work there and I just ran out of time. So we burnt it after the the every all the ice on the southern end or yeah the south end of it had melted so we had a good wet line across the bottom of the property but you know it was still cold enough that we weren't getting anything as far as salamanders or any of those other creatures crawling around so uh the sparse multiflora rose multiflora rose does not like fire it dies so you can get rid of it. <laughs> any other questions from folks? Yeah, I don't see any in the chat or in the Q&A. 
last chance people if you have so to say fairfax has one in the comments thank you this is very informative maybe a winter time barberry burn at the sour limb preserves that's going to take a lot of work um we're working towards that eventually probably introducing fire up there um we're starting with baby steps and there's only one of me to supervise all these guys burning. And Mike didn't say it, but we didn't get all the property burned up at his place that we wanted to. Um, we just ran out of weather window and, and time. And now we're into the growing season burn and under his management objectives, they don't wanna do the growing season burn because it can affect all those other creatures that we have to deal with. So that's the, like I said at the beginning, Writing the burn plan takes the stewardship part of it and also the fire part of it to come up with what we can and can't do. It's a partnership. It's not just me wanting to go haphazardly set stuff on fire and making sure that we're trying to meet the goals of the land managers or the stewards of the land, regardless of whether it's a county park, a private burn or like the Audubon or a state park because I have to play within all of those realms to get the job done. And you do a great job. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Also, I just want to mention that after um, I after they had burned Cider Mill, I walked over the burnt part, which was actually quite cool, quite sh a short period of time after the fire had gone through. And I was finding living insects that were sheltering in the roots of, you know, or d down just under the part that had been burned. I found some geometer moth caterpillars and uh, a mm -hmm. few other bugs. So not everything get, gets killed by, by this type of burn, except the vegetation. That pretty much is a goner. <laughs> so again, this year I did a lot of burning with the, the folks from the, uh, the Great Swamp. Uh, we have a great partnership between them and us and, uh, Every time I burn with those guys, they only burn for ecological reasons. Okay, so every time I burn with them, I always pick up something or learn something new about this species of grass or this species of weed that we can't send fire through. And we were looking at a, um, a patch of mugwort, which is another invasive oh. that we have problems with. And we sent this fire cranking right into this patch of mugwort and you would have swore it burnt right into a brick wall. I mean, it just completely oh. died out. Like no flames, it went from five foot tall flames to nothing instantly. So, you know, that's another plant that, you know, fire doesn't affect it. It is an invasive. It's not great to have a ton of it, especially if you have a whole patch that's like a half acre. Um, but if you mow it and burn the, burn the stalks it's a rhizome as well so you're going to have to treat it with a, some type of chemical mm. but you know this is a learning curve for all of us and you know i've only been in charge of this section for 10 years now and every day is a learning thing for me uh you know different species i i was up at the uh what was it the union county wild earth fest days and i got a list of native grasses and i'm learning more species of grasses every day and seeing if they're fire dependent uh, so that was from the who was that from i think it was from uh washington crossing pennsylvania side of the river bowman's hill wildflower preserve had a bunch of different handouts they had over there uh so Learning all the new grasses is tons of fun for me. I don't know if celandine would be emerged during the traditional burning window. This is uh, another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, grows on stream banks and kind of low lying areas. I know one place where there's a, an enormous stand of it. Um, if it's not emergent, during the winter, then there's really nothing to burn. Once you get into late April or early May, we pretty much shut down burning here because, well, we have the wood turtles as well. They're going to be hibernating in the river and don't come out until mid to late April. Um, and I think that's probably the time the celandine is coming up. 
um, late April and May. So I, I don't know if that would fit in a window, would it, George? Again, it would have to be a growing season burn okay. um, to try and control that one. Uh, the other thing is being that it's so in and on the stream beds, you might never get it to burn because of the, the higher humidity right along the stream bed. Um, we can get fire to carry down to the moisture of extinction, we call it, um, which could be that the humidity, uh, it, it's just too high for anything to combust at that point. The fuel is too wet. Um, sometimes you have that, actually, we experienced that down at Ball Pate Mountain last year when we were doing, or two years ago, last year when we were burning there. Um, we tried to do one block and the humidity at one foot off the ground was higher than it was standing in the woods uh, by almost 15%. So we couldn't get fire to carry through the woods because the fuel was too wet it was too moist underneath all of the plants that were there. The actual plants were giving off moisture like they normally do. And it was raising the humidity enough that it was extinguishing the fire. So Hannah wrote again, mile a minute controlled by burning. Yes, we can do it, but we just got to figure out how to get rid of the seed bed. Um, and we're going to work on that up there with the test burn up at the Washington Valley Park. So uh, from all the reading that I've done on that, that was one of the downfalls to the burn that we did up there. We got rid of the barberry, but now we have mile a minute of weed. So we're gonna try doing mile a minute of weed in July and trying to get rid of it then. So That's yes, we're gonna, little, little timing can be everything on that, you know? So we're gonna test it and see what we do. And then we'll do it again next year in the same patch if we have enough fuel, so. Do you actually have a humidity gauge during re doing readings during the burn? At least, at least every hour, somebody spins the weather using a sling psychrometer. And I also carry a Kestrel, which gives me the RH by just looking at it. I can just scroll through temperature and it's recorded in my, uh, my burn book that I have to fill out on every prescribed burn. Uh, checking off all the little things that, yes, we notified everybody the day we burned uh, and it's recorded, the weather's recorded every hour. Um, if we're close to being out of prescription, I could adjust that and have them do it every half hour. So we actually spin weather, it's a wet bulb and dry bulb thermometer. And then you use the uh, chart and you look at the chart versus the wet and the dry bulb and it gives you the humidity. So yes, we do do the humidity every hour. Does the burn itself change the pH, soil, the soil pH? Yes, it does. It puts a lot more nutrients back into the soil. Um, so it could change the pH depending on what's there. You know, you're, you're adding ash back into the soil. So you're gonna be adding some some sort of pH plus or minus in there. Maybe more alkalinity. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, I think that's about it. Fairfax just did mention that uh, Selen dye does oh, come no. out in March here uh, in our particular area, uh, a bit but south of where Mike there. is. But the leaves are still there now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still, I imagine you'd run into your moisture issues. Yeah. I think I remember Fairfax from summer camp. <laughs> that was a few years back. <laughs> she's she's a, a, a real advocate for wildflowers, native Good. wildflowers. <laughs> um, OK, does anything else speak now or forever hold your peace? Hannah says, uh, fascinating, thank you. I agree with her. It was fascinating. And uh, I just wish there was something that you could do to burn mugwort because that stuff is awful. <laughs> seen acres of it and it just, you know, there's, it, it just seems to, to defy everything you try and do with it. So it's uh, you've got to admire its ability to survive, I guess. But uh, 
It still I think happen. it rates right up there with my other favorite plant, which is um, uh, <laughs> just escaped me. The other really famous one, the Phragmites. Oh, Phragmites. Oh. oh, gosh, yeah. Burning doesn't work on frags. It'd be hard to choose between the two, which is worst. Well, frags, frags you can burn, and then you automatically have to treat them with aquatic roundup because of the water. Um, so, you know, it's effective. Virginia has a huge program that they do for Phragmites down in the state of Virginia in the coastal areas to get rid of it. And they do burn it and then they treat it with aquatic Roundup right. to kill it. So um, email addresses for use we use for later. Yeah, I'll just I'll type it into the chat. Great. Thank you. And if uh, anybody wants that after the program and didn't get it, um, I can provide you with those as well. Just contact.wcas at gmail.com. Yeah, you can throw my email in there if you want, George. I don't know, see how to do that. I'd have to look yours up, Mike. I don't know it off the top of my head. Hmm. It's got, pretty I, hard, you know. It's first name dot last name at njaudubon.org. <laughs> A-U-D-U. -A I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> Jim will handle this. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, well, I guess um, if nobody has any more questions and everybody knows how to get in contact with you guys, um, I have to say thank you very much for, for a great presentation. I know that's been um, a source of a lot of uh, controversy and conversations around here as we, we see more and more places going um, you know, two burns uh, in order to deal with this horrendous problem of invasive species. Um, so um, I think you provided us with some excellent information. You probably will get a few more questions later on too, which I'm sure you'll be able to answer capably. And um, I would like to uh, just say thank you to everyone who joined us tonight as well. This will be our last program for the current season. We'll be back again in September with our uh, programs. Not sure whether they're going to be live or on Zoom or on some sort of a um, hybrid uh, platform. We'll just have to figure this out as we go along, but we'll certainly be letting you know. So thank you again. George and Mike, um, wonderful to have you with us, and um, I will say good night to everyone else. Oh, by the way, I did put this in the chat, too, that um, the uh, slate of officers and new board members has been, um, has been uh, accepted, and we're good to go for next year. Thank good. you very much. Good night, everyone. Good, good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.